Revenons au forte. from uh, what I hope are the penultimate stages of quarantine hair. Um, I decided to make a video today talking about um, one of the most prolific and best record labels um, for classical vinyl collectors, and that's uh, Decca Records. Um, I got a lot of comments about Decca on um, my video I did, I think, three years ago now on classical record collecting. And so I wanted to kind of go into more detail about Decca. Um, you know, some of the things that uh, record collectors talk about when they're talking about DECA, specifically DECA stereo, just because I'm not really a mono collector. So I'm going to leave that to people who know more about that than I do. Um, but I am a big uh, fan of DECA's stereo era from the late 50s up through the digital age of the 80s. Um, and that's not to say that DECA aren't releasing um, great recordings after that era. I mean, early digital was rough, but um, there's plenty of great Decca recordings up through the 90s, 2000s, um, even today, although they've been you know, merged with every label under the sun most record labels have at this point. But a lot of people who collect classical vinyl records, and especially people who collect classical vinyl records with sound quality in mind, um, really admire Decca's from all periods of the analog era. And um, Decca records can be very collectible and um, very sought after, and some of them can get expensive and hard to find. And um, there's a lot to love in these recordings, and not just for sound quality, because um, you know a lot of Decca records from all across the analog period have excellent sound quality. Um, some are truly remarkable reference recordings, but also the performances are historic and um, very interesting, especially if you go back into early Ernst Ansermé Orchestra Swiss Roma recordings. There's lots of recordings with Herbert von Karajan before he kind of took absolute control of the Berlin Phil and he was recording with lots of other orchestras like Vienna and the Philharmonia Orchestra and things like that. And lots of these Decca recordings, uh, they capture uh, orchestral sounds that really don't exist anymore, like some of those Paris Conservatory recordings. Yes, the Paris Conservatory is still a fantastic orchestra and they still have their own sound, but they're, they don't sound like they did in the 50s and 60s anymore. So there's so many different reasons why um, these recordings are special. Many of the recordings that were done uh, in England uh, were done in Kingsway Hall, which was a fantastic sounding um, space for classical music that no longer exists. Unfortunately, it was torn down. I mean, it did, it did have a problem. There was a metro line running under it. And in a lot of these recordings, if you have speakers that go low enough, you can hear the rumble of the metro. So I, I do understand why they abandoned it. But still, it was a very special sounding space. Um, and lots of historic recordings in, in special places, special halls in Vienna. So there's a lot to offer in these recordings. So because of all the reasons that people love stereo decos, um, and because of all the reasons that people collect them and, and uh, hunt them down, I wanted to kind of uh, pass on some of the things I've learned, uh, some of my knowledge and what I know about the labels, um, what to look for, what certain things mean in deca collecting, um, because if you go on any, you know, eBay or Discogs and, and start browsing Decca records, you start seeing all these words and terms that you may or may not be familiar with. And it can get kind of confusing for um, new listeners. So without further ado, I'm going to show you guys some Decca records and kind of explain what periods they're from, what the labels mean, what the jackets mean, and kind of take you through some of the common terminology and pressings that you may run into in your vinyl hunting adventures. Um, as I mentioned in my now three-year-old video, um, the earliest 
DECA, British DECA releases in stereo were from what's called the DECA 2000 series. The 2000 series uh, essentially was just the catalog number SXL and then 2000 something. Those were the earliest stereo DECAs from about you know 1958 or so to like 1960. Um, and those also have uh, different style uh, logos on the jackets than what we get later on, um, even just a few years on. I do not have originals of those because they're quite expensive. At least I don't have them in British DECA. Um, so I'm going to put some graphics up on the screen. A lot of the early uh, 2000 series DECA jackets have logos like these. And also a select few of them have what's called a blue back. Now, we're going to get to London blueback, which is a different thing, but some early decas had a, a blue like trim on the back of the jackets. Again, I don't have an original to show, but I can show pictures. And um, these were done in very small quantities for a select number of releases, and they eventually moved away from this. These early 2000 series decas, especially with the uh, blue back on the jacket, command very large amounts of money, um, hence why I do not own one. But just a few years on, DECA would switch to what's called a 6000 series numbering system. So I want to show you a very early 6000 series record. Um, this is uh, a recording of Strauss's Der Rosenkavalier with uh, Regine Crespin singing as the Marchand. Uh, this is a wonderful piece and a really brilliant recording, but this allows me to talk about um, the actual pressings and the labels and what you want to look for on the vinyl itself. A lot of people who have browsed Decca Records online probably have seen terms like Edition 1, Edition 2, and Edition 3. So I want to explain what those mean and, and how they're relevant to collecting and sound. So throughout the late 50s into the early and mid 60s, uh, much of Decca's equipment that they were recording, cutting, mixing, mastering with, all, all that stuff was tube based. Um, Especially the lathes were, were very early stereo lathes that had their own quirks and features to them. And the combination of all these things yielded records that had an incredible sense of um, warmth and space. Now, how much of that is intended and how much of that is just an effect of the equipment at the time is up for debate. And, um, you know, it's okay to not like the sound of these early decos, but a lot of people do, myself included. Um, I think there's something about this early tube deca stereo sound that captures the essence of maybe like sitting in the hall itself rather than getting an up-close view of the orchestra. And that's definitely um, something that's lacking in a lot of modern recordings. It's something I think you've heard me talk about on this uh, channel before. So I want to show you what to look for to know what kind of uh, equipment your record would have been pressed on judging by the label. So I have here what is referred to as a edition one deca label. Edition one covers the years. This includes records pressed from about you know the late this advent of the stereo era, so like 1958 or so, um, to from what I recall about 1965 is when they definitely had phased out the edition one labels. So for deca, this is the British deca pressed in England with the deca logo. Edition one labels are going to be distinguished by a few things. So uh, when you're looking at these, you're going to want to look for the unboxed DECA logo here, um, the little circle logo just above it that has the uh, words full frequency stereophonic sound in that little circle, and also the wide band that goes across the length of the record that says full frequency stereophonic sound. Um, so all of this plus the uh, presence of a deep groove, um, that is a um, raised groove along the outside of the label that covers about, um, I would say a third of the label, um, with the rest of the label being sunken in. All of this makes for a deep groove pressing, but there are multiple additions that are deep groove pressings. Um, so how you know it's an addition one is up here on the upper left, you're gonna see the words original recording by, and on the other side, the DECA Record Co. Um, so that's what, that's what distinguishes edition one from all other editions of DECA Records. Up here it will say original recording by, and then of course you got all the other stuff, the wide band, the unboxed DECA logo, but original recording by, that's what makes it an edition one. Now, uh, edition one pressings of DECA Records, especially, you know, 
the true British decas with the right jacket and everything uh, can get very expensive because they're the earliest. Most of my original edition one decas are um, like opera highlights albums because those are the cheapest. So now I'm going to show you um, what's referred to as an edition two deca label. And here we have an excellent recording of Dvorak's Symphony Number no. 7 with uh, Ispan Cortez and the London Symphony. This is actually one of my favorite decas in my collection. It's a brilliant sounding recording, brilliant performance by Cortez, who's kind of a Dvorak expert. Um, it's S SXL uh, 6115, so it's still kind of early in the 6000 series. And uh, it also has a wide band, deep groove deca logo, but there's a difference. So it has, essentially, when you look at the label, all of the things that an Edition 1 label has. It has the unboxed DECA logo, the little circle full frequency stereophonic sound logo at the top, full frequency stereophonic sound in a wide band that goes across the length of the label. It has the deep groove ridge that makes it a deep groove pressing. Um, the only difference between this and an Edition 1 is instead of up here on the left saying original recording by, it says made in England by the DECA Record Co. Now I should mention before I go on, um, there is one other type of grooved early DECA pressing that I don't have on hand to show you, but I'll show a picture here. There is what's called a pancake pressing. In a few select very early uh, stereo DECA pressings, they were, from what I understand, they were outsourcing some of their pressing to another plant nearby in the same area of England. And these pressing plants did produce a, a grooved label um, with the thick vinyl. However, uh, the groove was much narrower on the outside. So it created this very, very small, slim uh, ridge on the outside of the center label. This is what's called a pancake pressing. They're very rare, they're very sought after, they're very expensive. I have never heard one. I don't know how different they sound from the regular edition one pressings because some of the records uh, some of the records, like especially the early Ansermet ones, they're you can find them in a pancake pressing and also a regular edition one pressing. Uh, they come from the same masters and the same equipment, um, possibly the same lacquer cutting. However, they're just pressed at a different facility. So that's why they have that, um, that type of groove. So I may have mentioned this earlier, but the edition two decas were pressed in England from about 1965 to 1968. So for both Edition 1 and Edition 2, they were made using largely the same equipment. Um, the only difference is I think there was a slightly different vinyl formulation and maybe a slight difference in vinyl thickness. However, they were, to my ears, when I listen to an Edition 1 and Edition 2, they largely sound the same. It's It's been a while since I had, uh, I think at one point I did have a copy of both types of label on hand of the same recording to compare to, and I barely heard, I don't think I heard much of a difference really. Um, however, the Edition 1 labels command a lot more money than the Edition 2 labels. But to my ears, they sound pretty much the same. Where you start to get some more significant differences are when we get into what's called Edition 3. Um, so here, I'm gonna show you an Edition 3 label. Edition 3 DECA labels, were pressed from about 1968 to around 1970, 71. It varies per the release. So here I'm gonna show you, um, this is actually, I pulled out some records that I really like for this video. Um, this is another one of my favorite Decca recordings. This is Ernst Ansermé and Orchestra Suisse Romain conducting the Symphony No. 3 by Alberic Magnard. Now, even in classical circles, most people do not know who Alberic Magnard is. Um, he was a French composer who kind of broke the conventions of his national style and composed in a very um, Germanic style. A lot of people call him the French Bruckner. Probably the most interesting fact about him is that uh, he died during World War I, but not as an enlisted soldier. He died uh, when early on in the war, he was at his house in the countryside and he saw German soldiers marching over the horizon he then decided to fire at them from his house. Uh, and then the German soldiers came and uh, burned his house down with him inside it. It seems that to uh, people in classical circles, if they do know Albrecht Mignard, that's the story they know him for. 
But he also composed some fantastic symphonies, and this recording of Symphony Number no. Three is one of the only ones in existence. So um, the fact that I'm able to listen to this obscure composer that I enjoy in early Deca sound quality to me is is a privilege. Anyway, enough about Mignard. But um, so this is an edition three, and this recording was issued in 1969. It came out in 1969. So the edition three label is actually the original pressing of this album. A lot of the earlier decas that came out in the late 50s and early 60s, they stayed in print throughout the 60s. So for some of the earlier recordings, they were issued in an edition one, edition two, and edition three all throughout the 60s. They stayed in, in production. So without further ado, here is a DECA Edition 3 label. So Edition 3 is the final wide band uh, DECA label. So Edition 3, you'll notice that visually it looks almost exactly the same as an Edition 2. However, there's a few things to point out. Um, there is no more deep groove. There's no more groove at all in this label except for you know the very center spindle hole, which all the records have. But there is no outside groove on this label. So it's just a regular wide band. It's not a deep groove pressing. Also, the vinyl that these are pressed on starts to get a little thinner at this point. It's not quite as thick as the Edition 1 or Edition 2s. And the Edition 3s are significant because this is the period where Decca was starting to move away from tube equipment in its production chain. They were starting to use different cutting heads that had a little more high frequency to them, I think. And uh, you know, there what might have been still tube equipment in this production chain, but definitely we're starting to see the uh, start of transistor equipment here. And, you know, I hear almost no difference in the general sound of Edition 1 and Edition 2s, but I do start to hear it in Edition 3s. However, Edition 3s are very affordable um, on the secondary market, so I end up buying a lot of Edition 3s just because there are ways to get excellent sounding recordings on an excellent sounding pressing for very little amounts of money. Do they sound as amazing as maybe their edition one or two versions? Possibly, it depends on the pressing, but collectors seem to not go after these, so I do. Finally, we get to what you're probably gonna run into the most uh, digging through these British decas, and that's the narrow band label. So I have here a um, recording of Leonard Bernstein conducting the Vienna Phil in Mahler's Das Lied von der Erde. And uh, this is actually a, um, the serial number isn't a 6,000 or 2,000, it's, it's a set because I guess it's considered vocal music, I don't know. Sometimes Decca's catalog system confuses me a bit. But this is what's called a narrow band label. The narrow band label was used from about 1971 to uh, essentially the, the start of the digital era, so the early 80s. So here we can see what a narrow band DECA looks like. So we have a completely smooth label surface except for again the center spindle hole. And then um, we have full frequency stereophonic sound, however um, it's much smaller in the band and it doesn't go across the label and then we have a boxed DECA logo up here. But notice it's still gonna say made in England. Um, Towards the end of the 70s, they did start to produce some records in um, Holland with this similar label. Um, to me, those records don't sound particularly good, uh, but you can still get made in England for most of the stuff um, made by DECA throughout the decade of the 70s. Now, I do not recall if this particular recording, uh, if the narrow band is the original pressing of this recording, I, I just didn't bother to look it up before making this video. However, a lot of really fantastic performances, great recordings, uh, were first issued in the 70s by Decca. You know, the 70s is when you get a lot of the stuff uh, with Zubin Mehta and the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Those are some, some of his recordings of like Mahler and Strauss with that orchestra are fantastic. Uh, this is when you get the recordings of Georg Schulte with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Everything from his Beethoven, to you just everything he recorded with Chicago on Decca uh, in the 70s is incredible. So, you know, don't discount the narrow band Decca's. They're fantastic. They just don't go for a ton of money. 
But if you're just getting into collecting Decca records, the narrow bands, I mean, you can get them for 10 bucks and they sound excellent. Now, they are mostly made using solid state equipment. Um, they're cut using, you know, very different cutting heads from the type of stuff they were working with in the late 50s and early 60s. But different doesn't mean worse. Just because something is more collectible, rarer, and older doesn't necessarily make it better. It just makes it a little different. Um, I find things to appreciate about both of these eras of Decca. I think they're both very fine recordings. And if a particular pressing of a record is unaffordable, like some of the early stereo Decca's from the 2000 series, you may be able to find a narrow band pressing of that recording for a very small amount of money in comparison to what an original pressing would go for. So in that case, you know, it's just a matter of how much do you want to, you know, how much pain and suffering do you want to put yourself through to get as close to the original master tape as possible. The last original stereo era Decca that I want to talk about is uh, a little known series called Decca Headline. I, I mentioned this, I think, in my, uh, my previous classical video. So this is a Decca Headline release. It's um, music by Xenakis. So most of the Decca Headline series was music by um, modernist 20th century composers, post-World War II composers. There's releases by um, Xenakis, Messian. Um, I think at one point uh, Steve Reich might have been issued. I don't, I don't know all the, the issues, but there's about a dozen or so of these Decca Headlines out there. And uh, the music depending on the composer, may, may or may not be to your taste. Um, Xenakis, uh, I grabbed this one because Xenakis is probably the most extreme example of this Decca headline series. His music is kind of the most iconoclastic. Uh, I, can, I can enjoy his music at times, but it's definitely not an everyday listen for me. However, these Decca headline recordings, the way they recorded them, uh, they are truly reference quality recordings. So if you like the music, look out for these Decca headlines. They sound fantastic. I believe these also use, yeah, these use just a regular 70s British Decca narrow band label, just like the other 70s Decca's. However, this series was recorded a bit differently. Um, I don't know what type of setup they were using. I just know they sound very, very realistic. Now, I don't know about you guys in the audience, but I live in the United States. So getting British Decca's is more challenging than let's say, you know, uh, listeners in Europe. In fact, uh, the majority of the records that Decca produced in the 50s, 60s, and 70s were actually London's. Um, most of you are probably familiar with London Records. So what London Records were, London Records was the American subsidiary of Decca Records. So after World War II, um, Decca actually did not own the rights to the name Decca in the United States. Another smaller label uh, was releasing records under the name Decca in the US. So uh, Decca had to find another way to release their records, so they, they came up with the London label. Um, London Decca records, uh, at this period, the stereo period from the late 50s throughout the 60s and the 70s, were essentially the same as Decca records. What I mean by that is the actual physical records were pressed on the same equipment at the same plants in England as the Decca records. The only difference is the label and the jacket. The jackets were actually uh, made in the United States, so Decca would press the records in England along with their regular British Deccas, ship them over to the United States where uh, the, the US label would put their jackets on it. Now, there are people uh, in the classical record community that insist that uh, British Decca's with the Decca logo sounds better than uh, British London records with the London logo. Now, with any record that's pressed in large numbers, like most records were in the mid 20th century, I mean, th these, were released, these were released in huge numbers. There is going to be some pressing variation. No two copies of a record are gonna sound alike just because they were maybe pressed at different times on different pressing machines. Um, using different mothers or different fathers, different metal parts, etc. So there's going to be some sound variation. But the idea that there, that uh, British Decca records sound uniformly better than American London releases um, is a myth from everything I've been able to research about this. There seems to be overwhelming evidence that that's the case 
and there seems to be absolutely no evidence to support the idea that these records uh, are somehow on a different sound quality plane. Uh, there's testimony I've read from actual mastering engineers and supervisors who worked for DECA in the 60s testifying that these are the same records. So I'm going to believe the people that actually worked on them rather than um, some people on internet forums. But everyone is entitled to their opinion. Uh, the nice thing about this opinion is it's made, uh, while DECA records remain very expensive, the London counterparts remain very affordable, um, especially in the American market. The only uh, caveat to uh, going for London records instead of the DECA counterparts is unfortunately that American record buyers simply did not take very good care of their records in comparison with British record buyers. Um, Londons are a lot more likely to be completely beat to shit than Decca's. Um, a lot of Londons were played on uh, those early, you know, uh, record changing machines that just uh, chewed up and spat out records. So, you know, there is that to consider. And also the, the jackets on the, the Decca releases are really nice. They're really laminated. They really hold up well over time. And as I'm about to show you, the London records were produced on kind of a more rough uh, card stock that just doesn't hold up as well over time. Now I have here a very early London release. So a lot of what I was saying earlier, how I, I didn't have any uh, DECA records from the 2000 series uh, on DECA because they're very collectible and very expensive. I have many of them in their London counterparts and it's the same record on the inside, it's just a different jacket use different artwork, etc. So I have here a very early um, London stereo record. This is Mendelssohn's Third Symphony, the Scotch Symphony, conducted uh, by Peter Mogg and the London Symphony Orchestra. This is an incredible recording. Very good sounding, excellent performance by the orchestra. And I don't recall off the top of my head, but I believe the original um, Decca release of this album uh, was a 2000 series. They just didn't use the 2000 um, lettering on uh, on London releases. Uh, you know, DECA releases, the lettering is SXL, whereas the London copies use the, uh, use the serial CS, and they use a different numbering system. But these early London releases are often called um, blueback records. So uh, this jacket is very typical of the early, early uh, London DECAs. You have this big rainbow stereophonic label at the top with the old school London logo. Usually if you see the old, the old London logo up here, um, it means that when this, when this was released, the, the DECA equivalent was the DECA stereo triangle logo. And uh, here we get what's called a blue back. So on these early Londons, lots of them were released with a blue back. And uh, the number of releases on London that contain this blue back is, is many, many times greater than the uh, DECA ones that had, a, that had a blue tinted back because these jackets were, were made in the US. But the record itself is made in England. And I'm showing you, what I'm showing you here is an example of an edition one London record. Now I've had to do a bit of digging on, on some of this information because while there's tons of information online, about DECA editions, there's less, almost no information online about London editions. I've kind of had to do some detective work. Um, so like the DECA releases, this has a deep groove, the same deep groove that you'd get on edition one releases. You get the full frequency stereophonic sound, nice big wide band here. And uh, you get an unboxed kind of cursive italic, well, not really cursive, but you get an italic London logo here, unboxed with the full frequency stereophonic sound logo at the top here. This is an edition one DECA. I believe to the best of my knowledge, they use this label for the same years that uh, DECA in England uh, used edition one DECAs. So you're gonna see these London logos on releases from you know about 1958 to roughly uh, 1965. And unlike, from what I've been able to gather, unlike uh, the DECA releases, the London releases actually change, the look of the label changes quite a bit from edition one to edition two. So now I'm gonna show you an edition two DECA label. Here is an edition two uh, London DECA blueback, another blueback. Uh, this record is uh, Schumann's Piano Concerto played by Wilhelm Bachfuss. Um, 
another lovely recording. I, I, I picked these because they're my favorites. However, this was originally, I believe, issued as an edition one. However, the pressing I have is an edition two. So let's see what that looks like on the label. So from everything I've been able to gather, this is an edition two uh, British pressed London record. And you'll notice that it looks very different from the previous um, edition one London label. We still have the deep groove on the outside, so the record itself still is pretty much the same. However, the label's very different. Instead of full frequency stereophonic sound in the band here, we just have a wide band that says stereophonic. It's a little bit narrower, but it still goes the length of the record. Um, and now we have the boxed London logo that uh, uses the FFRR uh, advertising logo, uh, full frequency range recording. These terms, full frequency range recording and full frequency stereophonic sound, by the time the stereo era rolled around, they don't actually mean anything. They're just um, marketing terms. So it's like a like an advertising term. So anyway, the, the big important thing to note with these addition to London releases is that they still have the deep groove logo. Um, that's what keeps them still in, in the old style pressing tube era. These were, again, like the British Decca, to the best of my knowledge, uh, made from about 1965 to 1968. And while the original Edition 1 London releases are very affordable compared to the Decca counterparts, the Edition 2 Londons are even cheaper. I believe I got this record for about $12. Um, and it sounds incredible. It still has that nice big tube uh, hall sound with the excellent dynamics that Decca is known for at this period. So yeah, it's, it's, these Edition 2s are just as great um, often as the Edition 1s. The Edition 3 London Decca that I have to show you uh, is actually interesting because it's the same record I showed you in an Edition 3 on the Decca's. It's the same Anserme Munyard Symphony No. 3 recording, but this time on London. Notice how much cooler the Decca jacket is than the London jacket. The London jacket's kind of boring and plain. The Decca jacket was very colorful and nice and shiny. So that's just another reason why, you know, the Decca's are a little bit nicer to own than the London's sometimes. They just, it's a little bit of a more luxurious product. So looking at this Edition 3 London label here, it's very, it's the same things to look for in the Decca version. You'll see here, um, the label looks pretty much the same as the Edition 2 uh, London logo, uh, you know, made in England and everything like that. However, um, there's just no deep groove. The, the record is a little thinner and there's no grooving in the uh, center label, um, only in the center spindle like normal. So just like Decca, this is the last of the wide band uh, labels for London. They stopped pressing these in about 1971-ish and moved to the narrow band logo, which I'm about to show you now. So this is a 70s London narrow band pressing uh, of the fabulous Kung Wah Chung playing uh, Tchaikovsky and Sibelius violin concertos. Um, I think actually the original Decca pressing of this uh, can get kind of expensive. It's kind of a sought after recording. The London one is very affordable. So just another reason to, you know, not pass on the Londons. They're usually deals. You can see on the London label here, it's uh, very, very similar to the Decca narrow band of this era of the 70s. Um, you have the narrow stereophonic band that doesn't go to the edges of the label, a completely smooth center label, kind of a smaller label too, um, in diameter. Uh, no deep grooves or anything, uh, still uses the box logo. And um, for a lot of people hunting for classical recordings in, in North American record stores, this is the, the London that you're probably gonna run across the most. Um, you'll usually be able to buy these fairly cheaply. Maybe not this recording because it's kind of a sought after performance. But a lot of the stuff, especially with like Schulte in Chicago, uh, a lot of my London Schulte Chicago recordings pressed in England, uh, I picked up for a dollar or two dollars, usually less than five dollars um, in record stores. So collecting these, these Londons can be very affordable depending on what you're looking for. So now that I've taken you through pretty much every London and Decca label uh, in the analog era, I want to talk to you very briefly about some of the reissues of these recordings that are out there. The significant reissues of this catalog were actually done by Decca themselves in the late 70s, I believe. Uh, throughout much of the 70s, they would release 
they would release a lot of these early recordings on what's called uh, in in England they were calling them the Decca Ace of Clubs or Ace of Diamonds I think and in America they were calling them the London Stereo Treasury series a lot of times what these were was uh, they would actually go back and take the original metal parts from uh, a lot of these releases and just press them on very very cheap vinyl so the good news is if you're looking for very cheap copies of these recordings we're talking like dollar bin copies of these recordings you can get them um, and oftentimes the information in the grooves the actual music in the grooves can be almost as good as the original thing however the vinyl they were pressing these on because this was a budget reissue series lots of times the vinyl they were pressed on is quite thin and noisy it's quite bad quality vinyl I have yet to find at least in America a, a London Stereo Treasury series record that isn't noisy so for me personally for that reason I ignore them typically however your mileage may vary so feel free to try them out it's not exactly an expensive gamble if you don't like them but now actually I want to get into uh, the first audiophile reissues of this catalog and these recordings. I talked about these in my previous uh, classical collecting video but I wanted to mention them here so I have everything in one place regarding Decca. The first uh, big audiophile reissues of uh, these recordings came from a record label in Japan called King Records and they are the King Super Analog series. These were recordings that were taken from the original masters of Decca, sent over to Japan I believe and uh, which is rare because a lot of times master tapes don't move. I believe they did send them to Japan. Now I could be wrong and maybe a Japanese team went to England but I do know that they got the original masters for these which is um, not something that usually happens when it comes to Japanese records. Anyway so these were done uh, from the original master tape using all tube equipment apparently um, and the goal with these was to capture as much of the actual original master tape as possible or the original set session tapes. I don't remember if they were using the track tapes or the, the finished master tape. However, the result is um, a kind of different sound than the original Decas. There's way more bass on these than, than some of the original Decas and there's just more big sound and, and dynamics in it, to some extent because they were cut using modern equipment. However, the sound quality in these is a little darker, I would say, than the original Decas. These were released uh, starting in the mid to late 80s in Japan. And then at one point in the 90s, uh, the, the catalog of these releases by King Records was bought out by an American company called Cisco Music. Cisco actually bought either the, the tapes or the um, actual metal parts, I don't know which, from King Records, uh, bought, bought it from them, had them shipped over to California, and then Cisco uh, were continuing to press these King releases uh, at RTI in California. So some of these King releases are pressed in Japan and some of them are pressed in uh, the US, but it uses the same masters, so the sound is very similar. The only difference is the vinyl formulation, which you know, these original Kings, I believe, were pressed at JVC, so they use the JVC vinyl formulation, which is just dead quiet. It's some of the best vinyl that's ever been made. Uh, whereas the later ones are pressed at RTI, and RTI is an excellent pressing plant. Probably at the time these were made, RTI was the best plant in the US. So, you know, a lot of these you'll find US pressings, but you can also find, easily find the Japanese ones. I haven't noticed a big difference between the pressings, to be honest. They both have kind of the same sound signature. This particular one is a um, original Japanese pressing. You'll notice in both instances, uh, the US and the Japanese pressings keep the, the, the Japanese obi strips and, um, you know, the association with, with Japanese King Records stays even in the Cisco releases. So I think if you're a big DECA collector, um, the King Super Analogs are definitely worth trying. In some ways, they are some of the best sounding uh, of my DECA collection, but only in some ways. Um, there's something about the brilliance of the original DECA sound that just isn't really there for this. 
However, it's nice to hear some of these recordings with you know the big thundering bass and dynamics that just wasn't possible on the lathes of the time uh, that Decca had. I mean, finally, the, the final reason that uh, these are desirable for a lot of people, myself included, is that uh, you know a lot of the the Decca releases, especially the old ones. Um, they're hard to find in clean condition, and almost all of the uh, the kings you're going to find are in really excellent condition. Not to mention the vinyl is super quiet to begin with. So if you want really like dead quiet pressings of these albums, uh, the kings are the way to go. The next company to kind of dig into the Decca catalog of this era is the uh, German label Speakers Corner. They release a ton of of reissues of you know classical music from the mid 20th century, and they've done a a huge, huge series of the original Decca's, and they recreate the original jackets. This is my Speaker's Corner pressing of Dvorak's New World, again with Cortez, excellent Dvorak conductor. And they do their best to recreate the original jackets. They are not the, the tip-on style jackets that the original Decca's use, but you know, that costs a lot of money to do. They even recreate the original inner sleeve. And the, the label is, um, like printing wise, they recreate the original edition one Decca label. However, um, there's no deep groove because that's just, you know, they went to a regular pressing plant, not a Decca record pressing plant. I believe these are pressed at uh, Optimal in Germany. Uh, I could be wrong. Like the Kings, uh, the Speaker's Corner, you know, Speaker's Corner's whole thing is they do everything all analog, all analog chain. I don't think they had tube gear. I think they use solid state gear. Um, there is information on the people who, you know, remastered these. Uh, I think the speaker's corners are great for getting some of these really early rare releases. I think originals of this particular Decca recording get quite expensive, um, as the case for a lot of the, the 2000 series Decca's. So I, I think they're, they're very good routes to go on if you want to hear some of these recordings at an affordable price. Um, I think they, they do lack a little bit of, of the uh, magic of the original recordings. The same as the King, but in a different way. Like the, I think the Speaker's Corner uh, reissues can sound a little bit dry at times. However, um, that's also an age of the tape thing. Um, by the time Speaker's Corner got to these in the 90s, the tapes were already uh, you know, 40 years old. And they continued to release Decca recordings up through the early 2010s. By that time, they were, you know, 50, almost 60 years old. So there's something to be said for uh, a record pressed on a, you know, a fresh tape, not an old tape. But, you know, these are like 35 bucks, and for that, you can't really go wrong. It's a great way to collect these recordings. To get even more audiophile, um, we have here, these are the original recording group reissues of some of these Decca's. Now, what's funny is they ended up using the London jackets for these. I don't know why they, uh, I guess they got the, the rights to the London jackets. So these reissues were released by ORG, or the Original Recordings Group, and uh, not to be confused with ORG Music, which is also another reissue label. And they did these on uh, double 45. So two 45 RPM records. Um, this is, of course, the famous Holst Planets recording with Azubin Mehta, um, long an audiophile favorite. And these 45 RPM pressings sound really good. Uh, they're quite excellent. They only released about, I think so far, they put out about maybe 10 of them, and there's a couple more that they're scheduled to release. However, it's been taking forever. Um, and these sell out pretty quickly. You know, the Speaker's Corner you can still get even 10, 15 years after they're released, even new, sealed. Um, these have sold out quickly. I think they're a little more limited. Mine is number 982 out of what? I don't know. But uh, these go kind of fast. Um, so if you're interested to hear what they sound like, I, I wouldn't wait too long. Because these are 45 RPM pressings, I will say the dynamics on these, the few that I have, I think I have about four of these, the dynamics are the most impressive I've ever heard of, out of a Decca recording. Um, and I think that's to do with the fact that you can cram a lot more information on a 45 RPM record. You can cut bigger dynamics on a 45 RPM record than you can on a 33. Um, I don't remember who mastered these or where these mastering was done. I should have looked that up before I made this video. 
There is one more audiophile label that uh, got their claws into the DECA catalog that we need to talk about, and it's their label that on vinyl have only done this one release, I think, and that's Analog Productions. Now, uh, for those that follow my channel, you guys know that I think Analog Productions are the best modern reissue label in existence. The mastering quality, the, the quality of their chain, the quality of their pressing is probably the best in the business. So uh, I was very excited when a couple years back they announced that they were going to do this uh, DECA stereo recording of Mahler's Symphony No. 3 with the LA Phil. And uh, this is a 2LP 33 RPM set because the original, the original version of this was a box set. And it sounds quite excellent until you get to the last 30 seconds of the finale. Uh, and I guess they just kind of ran out of vinyl because the, the last 30 seconds of this actually get quite compressed and there's, um, they cut it a little too close to the label. So you get some, even if your turntable is set up really well, you're just going to get some inner groove distortion which is really disappointing because so much else on this pressing and recording is fantastic. And then, and then in the last 30 seconds, you're like, oh. So that's all I have to say about this. I don't know why they haven't done more of the DECA catalog. I guess because so many other labels have, have done it. But I wish Analog Productions would do more, more DECAs. They've, they've done a great job with the RCA Living Stereo catalog. So there are some reissues done by DECA themselves of parts of this catalog. Um, I would stay away from those. Those are from Digital Masters. I do not know uh, what type of Digital Masters they used. I don't even think they're high res and I don't actually think they were mastered specifically for vinyl. But my point is there's so many great ways to get analog versions of these analog recordings. Um, don't waste your money on uh, digital releases of them. Uh, at least if you want to listen on vinyl. If you want to, you know, play them on, you know, CD, SACD, or in high-res files like on Tidal or, you know, HD tracks or something like that, by all means, go for it. Everyone listens to music on different formats. But if you want vinyl copies of these releases, go for the ones that were made using uh, analog equipment like the original recordings were. So thank you guys for watching and sticking with me once again. It's been uh, fun watching this channel kind of uh, go in different directions and mature especially now that uh, you know the quarantine has taken its uh, hold and I don't know about you all but my entire orchestral season uh, for fall and spring of 20 and 21 has been canceled um, so it's nice to have a distraction and something to put some a little bit of energy into most of us in the arts right now are in a kind of uh, purgatory so to speak so I hope everyone is staying safe and sane through all of this. It's been a long haul, especially for those of us in the United States who are kind of watching with jealousy as the rest of the world um, seems to be over the hump and um, we're still kind of at the bottom of the hill pushing up the rock like Sisyphus. With that being said, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you uh, see something that I missed, uh, if you... Uh, have more knowledge in some of these areas than I do, by all means, leave a comment down below. I always welcome um, suggestions and questions down there, and I try to eventually get to them. I'm, I'm trying to do better at, at answering questions in my comments. So with all that being said, I think I'm going to wind down the video. I, uh, I love listening to uh, these Golden Age Decker recordings, and I know a lot of people take a lot of joy in them too, so I wanted to do my best to pass on my knowledge to you guys so that you can, um, you know, enjoy collecting and learning about these recordings with the most tools in your collecting toolbox. So stay safe, and I will see you guys in the next video. Cheers. One, two, three, blah, 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 here's a record.